Hey everybody, good morning. Uh, my name is João Correia. I've been a good friend of Jorge for many years and thank you so much for uh, the kind invitation to join you here today and thank you for being there as well. This, is, um, this presentation will focus on how sharks are in danger, which is a little bit strange because most people think of sharks and they think of humans in danger. But hopefully after these slides that I'll show you today, you'll see that sharks have a lot more to fear from us than we have to fear from sharks. Now, I come with, to you with many, many hats. As you can see on the slide here, the APC is the Portuguese Lasmobranch Association that focuses on um, conservation and research. Um, I'm a member of the Shark Specialist Group, which is a branch of the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature that focuses on shark conservation. Loving the Planet is a very cool organization that's trying to love and save the planet. And I highly recommend that you check these guys out, lovingtheplanet.org. They're doing really cool things for the planet. Flying Sharks is my consulting company, and the IPL is the school where I teach marine biology. So many, many hats, but I would say the main two hats are these two logos behind me, Loving the Planet and the Shark Association that uh, bring us here today. So uh, when I say sharks in reality, we're talking about uh, sharks, rays, and also chimeras. Uh, so excuse me if I, you know, every time I say sharks, just think about of all of these animals, it just makes things a little easier. Now sharks and rays, of course, are different from other fish, you know, from swordfish and tuna, because their skeleton is made of cartilage. Uh, instead of other fish, which are called bony fish, because their skeleton is made of bone. But uh, it's uh, a lot more um, significant than that. It's not just about the skeleton, because uh, sharks are, in fact, uh, much more like mammals when it comes to reproduction. And we will see that in a few slides. So they're actually a very different group of, um, unlike all the other fish that have millions and millions of eggs. Sharks and rays and chimerids have just a few young, uh, very much like dolphins or even cats and dogs, which of course is one of the reasons why they're so vulnerable to overfish. But let's, let's take a, a look at a few of the shark species before we go into their conservation and what we can do to help them. Now, this is a chimera. Uh, I know it's a bit of an unusual fish. Uh, most people haven't seen one. Um, you'll have to excuse me if I do some advertising to the Oceanario de Lisboa, the Lisbon Aquarium, where I worked for 12 years. I actually moved these animals there myself back in 2000. And uh, this, you know, it's um, a very cool place. And it's one of the places in the world where you can actually see these animals because they're not easy to see in the wild. But this is a uh, uh, chondrichthyon, which is a technical name for a cartilaginous fish. So just like sharks rays are cartilaginous, their uh, skeleton is made of cartilage, and so are um, chimerids. Now this is the Caribbean reef shark and the fellow in the t-shirt and the very sexy uh, dive gear there is me. This is me in 95 in Bimini, the Bahamas while studying lemon sharks for my undergrad and for my master's. And uh, you can see that this shark is very curious. I was trying to take a picture of it with one of those disposable plastic little Kodak old cameras. My good friend Tim snapped this picture. And you can see this animal is basically inquisitive. It's just trying to understand what the hell is this guy doing in the water? So we were not in danger at all. Needless to say, you know, in a situation like this where we throw some fish in the water to attract sharks, it's okay to go in the water and to get some pictures, but you have to be very aware of your surroundings and how the sharks are behaving because they can get a little too excited and you may have to leave the water uh, quite fast, which we had to a few times, but nobody ever got hurt while doing these shark dives. Now, this is the amazing Mako shark. Now, when I do this lecture in Portugal, I always ask people, is this a species that occurs in Portuguese waters? And 90% of the people I'm talking to will say, no, not at all. Nobody would go to the beach if we had this monster swimming in our waters. But it turns out that it is a very, very common species in Portuguese waters. And also very much in every temperate water um, in the world. 
Uh, you will find it off the, the shores of many African countries, America, Brazil, um, just about everywhere in the world. The, they are, of course, overfished like crazy. They're a bycatch of the swordfish and the tuna fishing industries. And they're seriously depleted these days, mostly because they are usually caught undersized. And we'll get back to this issue in a, in a few slides. And also because they only have a very few uh, amount of young. And so, of course, when they're overfished, it's very hard for them to, to replace their, their numbers. Now, here's another species. This is the blue shark that I usually ask people in Portugal, is this a common shark in Portuguese waters? And again, the same answer. Everybody goes, no, not at all. We would never go to the beach if this thing was swimming around. Well, this is an extremely common shark in Portuguese waters, just like the, the mako shark. In fact, on a, on a long liner, you know, the you know, um, fishing vessels that go out for swordfish, you will catch about um, 20 or 30 of these blue sharks for one mako shark. So these are extremely abundant. They actually breathe uh, in a more in a faster way than the mako shark, which is one of the reasons why the blue shark is the most fished shark in the world, and they're still not extinct. Uh, if they had the same reproductive ability that the mako shark does, uh, if they were caught, um, you know, in these numbers like they are, but they had the mako shark reproductive ability, they would have been wiped out decades ago. But still, uh, their numbers have been declining over the years. Now, this is a beautiful picture taken in the Azores by my former student, Nuno Vasco Rodrigues. Uh, he's a brilliant marine biologist, a researcher, an underwater photographer, and I seriously advise you to follow this young man's work. So Nuno Vasco Rodrigues, very nice man and, a, and an amazing photographer, as you can see. Now, this is the cookie cutter shark. This does not occur in Portuguese waters, but I'll let you know it's a scientific name and you will figure out where it does occur. So the scientific name for this species is Isistius brasiliensis. So brasiliensis, of course, comes from Brazil. This species is very common in Brazilian waters, particularly when uh, the um, uh, Rio de la Plata um, meets the, the ocean between Buenos Aires and Montevideo. Now, this is an area that actually had a lot of activity during World War II. A lot of uh, allies boats, a lot of um, German submarines, a lot of torpedoes flying around. Now, we know that this fish, which is the size of a shoe, actually would sometimes bite on in the rubber parts, in the plastic parts of submarines, like the sonars and all of that. So this little fish that's no bigger than a, a shoe may have in fact sunk a few submarines, um, which is you know, quite ironic that a fish that small would do something like that. Now, uh, I was almost forgetting to tell you that, see the, the, dent, uh, the dentition there, the, the lower jaw of this shark, uh, very, very pointy. This is the equivalent if, you know, if humans had teeth that big, our teeth would be the size of, a, of like a, a smint's uh, box or, or, you know, like a, a a box with um, a spearmint or something. Anyway, this shark will actually hit prey that's larger than its mouth, much larger. They will go after dead whales and stuff like that, and they will just bite and then rotate a little bit and yank out a semicircle of, uh, of meat, like a, a chunk of meat that's uh, circular, which is why it's called the cookie cutter shark. Now, this is the whale shark. Uh, very common in, again, uh, tropical and temperate oceans all over the world. Uh, interestingly, this shark did not used to occur in Portuguese waters, only in the Azores, in the middle of the Atlantic. We do spot them over there, but not in the mainland Portugal. And uh, the interesting thing is that with climate change, as waters are getting warmer and warmer, we are now seeing these uh, animals in uh, mainland Europe which is why, in fact, a few years ago, uh, Nuno Rodrigues, the, the young man that took the picture before, and I and a few friends, we actually published this um, very short paper, which was the first record of a whale shark in continental Europe, which is uh, interesting and really shows that climate change is not something to be played with because it is causing quite a few changes throughout the world. 
Now, this is one of the nine emmerhead species. Uh, the bigger one, the biggest one, of course, is the Sphirna mocarran, the great emmerhead, which we, uh, which is distributed pretty much all over the world in in tropical seas. This is Sphirna zigaina, the smooth emmerhead, which does occur in Portuguese waters as well. This was actually taken at uh, Flying Sharks, the the company where I do some consulting. We also ship some animals to aquariums throughout the world, only the large aquariums, the ones that are actively and really engaged with education and conservation. It turns out that this species does not like to be in an enclosed space. So we, we tried it a couple of times. They really did not do well. We ended up releasing them all. So you will not find this species in an aquarium because they just don't like that at all. Now, this is the taupe shark, uh, Galeorinus galeus. Uh, very common along the Portuguese shore and also all over the Atlantic. It used to be very, very heavily caught, which is one of the reasons why their numbers are, are decreasing um, severely. And it's one of those species that will sooner or later need to be seriously protected or they will just be gone from overfishing. Now, this is a manta ray. Uh, this is the Chilean devil ray, the Mobula tarapacana. Uh, very common in Azorian waters and pretty much all over um, the Atlantic, you will find these. But of course, some other manta rays as well, uh, the famous manta birros trees, uh, mobula, mobular, and so many others, beautiful animals, um, completely harmless, of course. You know, they have those cephalic lobes, those fins that you see on the, on the head. Actually, those are fins that, you know, they unfurl like this. And actually, they do like these ladles that help to channel uh, plankton into their mouths. And you will actually see them many times just looping, going around and around and around, especially at night when plankton is near the surface, you know, closer to the uh, trying to get to the light of the moon. So they're able to see it and they just kind of go in these loops and try to eat all that plankton. Now, this is a wobbegong shark. And the reason why I've been showing you all these different pictures is because uh, I wanna show you how different the uh, sharks can be, sharks and rays, uh, the, the tremendous diversity. So it's not just those pretty sharks that you see in the, you know, on the National Geographic. You've got these weird looking sharks like this wobbegong, which I will actually help you understand what we've got here. So. You've got the dorsal fin right over there, and then you've got the second dorsal fin right over there, and then you've got the tail stretching all the way, stretching all the way back there. Now this is uh, the type of shark that you will find in Australia, but not just there, in other wa uh, waters as well. And uh, see the amazing camouflage there. This shark basically looks like a rock, uh, and it basically stays there until some prey, like some shrimp, crab, even some small fish, will come close to its mouth. And at that point, the shark will actually swallow the prey. It'll actually suck it. So this shark will basically open its mouth in such a fast way, like just it snaps, like the mouth opens so wide and so fast that it'll actually suck all the water in front of it. And that'll, of course, suck the food right into its gut. So they don't actually jump on top of a prey. They just kind of suck it really, really fast, lightning fast. The fish doesn't even know. The prey doesn't even know what hit it. Now, this is a blue spotted um, uh, stingray. And you can see, let me just show you the sting right here. This is not something to be played with. You have to be extremely careful. When you're swimming in waters that, or you're if you're at the beach and you know that there's stingrays in that beach, the trick is you shuffle your feet. So you don't just, you don't lift your feet along the sand. You kind of go like, you just drag your feet along the bottom. As you know, sound propagates very, very well in water. And it it's just creates this very loud noise. You know, just if you put your ears underwater in the ocean, ask a friend to shuffle their feet and you will hear this. It's kind of annoying. And that'll actually drive these stingrays away because you do not want to step on one of these animals because of course it'll sting you. Uh, not to kill you, not to, you know, this thing doesn't want to hurt you, it's just defending itself because, well, you put your foot on, on its uh, body. Now, if it does happen, here's a, a little trick. The, um, the toxin, the poison that these 
uh, these uh, barbs will inflict on someone, it's very, very painful. But it's also of protein origin. So it's a protein. And as all proteins, it will actually lose its strength when, um, when uh, in increased heat, in increased temperatures. So here's what you do. If you're out diving with your friends and you accidentally get hurt by one of these stingrays, what you do when you get back to the surface is you ask the cook of the boat where you're diving from to warm some water. Now, you don't want to boil that water because then you'll have a burnt uh, ankle, you know. But if you got hurt in the ankle, just soak it in water that's as warm as you can take it, and you will immediately uh, feel that the pain is subsiding because the protein just stops working and the, and the pain slowly goes away. Then, of course, you take some painkillers and you know, you'll be fine. You may want to get an x-ray to make sure that the barb didn't stay inside. I'm not sure if you guys can see this on the camera. This is actually a barb that I took uh, off the floor of the open ocean tank in the Oceanario, where I, I said I worked for many years. See how long this thing is. It's very, very big. Now, and of course, it's also serrated, which is not easy to see on camera. But if the point is, if it goes in, it's extremely hard to, go, to get out. So if you do get hurt by one of these things, it's good to get an x-ray to make sure that there's no little bits of the barb inside, which of course have to be removed and disinfected. Okay, now, this is a horrible picture of a white shark. I, I took this picture myself in uh, South Africa uh, many years ago, 2012. I was there attending a conference, and of course, you can't go to South Africa and not be in the water with uh, whale sharks. That, uh, as we say in Portugal, would be like go traveling to Rome and not seeing the Pope. So we just have to see do something like that. Uh, here's a much, much better picture of a white shark taken again by my good friend, former student, and flying shark science officer, Nuno Rodrigues. Uh, we were in the water together. Uh, inside a cage, you know, just taking um, pictures of the white shark. I won't deny that I actually asked if we could go out of the cage. And of course, the boat guy told us that we were crazy and they were not going to allow us to do that. But the truth is that many people have been in the water with white sharks and not get hurt. Uh, now, I'm obviously not telling you to do that. It's a very bad idea, so please don't do it. But if you're with professionals who know what they're doing, that's something, the, the point here is that uh, if you're in the water with a white shark, it doesn't necessarily mean that that white shark will come and kill you. That's just not in their nature. Um, they will kill for many different reasons. You know, they, they will kill sea lions for food and that sort of thing, but they won't just jump on the diver just to kill it for, for no reason. That just doesn't happen. Anyway, now this picture is uh, interesting because let me guide you here with the, with the pointer. So uh, around here, we have a mako shark jaw, okay? So mako sharks like we saw in the beginning. And you can see that these are very pointy teeth, but they're not serrated. So a mako shark has a really hard time um, cutting through uh, meat. So the, what that means is that it'll probably take prey that are the size of its mouth. So it's not going to go and chomp a big piece of whale and, and yank out that piece of whale because it cannot do that. So it'll try to eat something, you know, big squid, big fish, big uh, small tuna that basically go whole in its mouth because these teeth are devised to just kind of grab something and pull it in. Anyway, that's a different scenario than the white shark teeth, which you see these two white triangles here. No, these are serrated. Now, these are teeth for cutting. So a white shark will hit uh, a seal or a sea lion or even a dolphin or even another shark. And it'll just bite down hard and then kind of shake its body and yank out sort of a semicircle of meat uh, because these teeth are in fact serrated and will allow for that. So the point of this slide is to show you that different shaped teeth will actually tell us what type of food that animal is taking. Uh, so, uh, Non-serrated teeth tell us that they, they are unable to, to cut um, cleanly, so they will probably take something that fits whole in their mouth. Now, in the middle here, you see this black triangle here, which you may be wondering what it is. Notice how it looks so much like a white shark tooth, right? Well, this is the great, great, great grandfather of the white shark called Carcarodon megalodon. It's an extinct species. It, 
it was gone some 4 million years ago, but we don't really know how big it was because there are no shark, uh, prehistoric shark fossils. And the reason is that remember that their skeleton is made of cartilage, not bone. So we have dinosaur fossils because well, bone is fossilized and bone will last forever for millions and millions and millions of years. It'll turn into rock in the last forever, but not cartilage. Cartilage cannot be fossilized. It's much softer and of course, uh, just the pressure of the dirt of, of earth and bacteria and microorganisms will basically eat away all that cartilage. So there are no um, shark skeleton fossils. They're just non-existent, except of course for the teeth. The teeth are very hard. You know, the teeth are, are just raw bone material. So these of course will last forever. So we don't know how big this shark was, but let's think about it. If a white shark tooth is about this big and the uh, the, the adult shark is, let's say, five, four, five to six meters. Then uh, a megalodon tooth that would be the size of, you know, of a cell phone. Uh, then it's not that much of a stretch to think that the, the big animal, the, where these teeth came from, would probably be the size of a, of a train cart, you know, the size of a big bus. So that's, um, that's a big shark and you definitely not want to mess with, with this one. But um, sadly, or happily for some people, they've, they've been extinct for 4 million years. Now, these, uh, um, this is an area in Portugal where there was a very uh, unfortunate accident a few years ago. Uh, some, uh, some rocks, there was a landslide, some rocks got loose. It actually injured uh, some people that were just at the beach. But when those rocks came tumbling down, it uncovered a bunch of uh, old uh, teeth, uh, like these ones that you, uh, that you see over here. And this is another area of Portugal that also has, is very, very rich in um, fossilized shark teeth. Now, let's go back to our uh, diversity of sharks. This is a leopard shark. Again, I'm trying to show you just uh, how diverse sharks are and uh, what different types of animals we can have. You've got your huge um, whale shark that eats plankton, doesn't hurt the fly. You've got your uh, white sharks, very powerful, four, five, six meter long animals. Mako sharks, which are in fact from the same family as white sharks. And then you've got your leopard sharks, which is the same um, a, a sort of a bottom dwelling shark that will actually, you will find them just resting on the bottom quite often. Uh, they will feed off little things that they'll find on the on the floor, you know, small invertebrates, shrimp, uh, prawns, uh, crabs, some small fish as well. So very different from a big whale uh, shark or even a big white shark. This is the, the very famous Carcarrinus longimanus, the white tip oceanic or the oceanic white tip shark. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this picture is also because of this cool uh, symbiosis that they have with this pilot fish that we saw in the blue shark picture that Nunu took a few slides ago also. Uh, this is a cool relationship they have because the pilot fish will eat some leftover food from the shark's mouth and also some parasites off its skin. And then of course they get protection because who's gonna eat the pilot fish? Nobody gets near, uh, no, no predator will get near a big shark like this. So they get protection from the shark and at the same time, they're gonna eat away leftover food from the teeth and everything. So that that's uh, one of the countless examples of wonderful symbiosis that we find in nature of uh, different species working together. Now, a little bit of reproduction. I've mentioned before that sharks are very different from other fish species because they uh, reproduce in a very different way. Now, uh, there's basically three different types of reproduction for sharks. This is um, ovoparity, which is basically um, just like chickens and, and ostriches and, and geese and ducks, uh, like birds, um, eggs, basically. Uh, the, the small embryo that you will find here is a small leopard shark embryo. It's going to uh, basically absorb this yolk. And this um, animal, this embryo is going to grow inside the egg uh, or inside the capsule. And at one point, the mother will start sort of scraping along the bottom. And, and these filaments that you find here in the egg capsule are going to assist the mother to just get to, to help release these egg capsules from inside 
the mother, and uh, then the eggs stay outside. And at one point, the little embryo is strong enough to just bite through the eggshell and just start to swim out. So unlike mammals, where usually parents will take care of their young for, for a few days or months or even years, uh, that doesn't happen with sharks. Once the embryos are born, they're, they just go and uh, live their life, and that's it. No contact with the, with their uh, parents anymore. Now let's jump to another type of uh, reproduction. This is called the viviparity, and this is basically what we have, what us mammals have. You'll notice here you've got the umbilical cord, right? So this shark was inside the mother's womb connected to the mother by this umbilical cord, which is exactly what we uh, human beings and uh, monkeys and giraffes and rhinoceros and elephants and horses and cats and dogs have. We're all connected to our mothers through an umbilical cord. And then the time comes to, to, uh, to born uh, for, for birth. And then of course, this umbilical cord is uh, severed, it's cut. Uh, the shark will probably just kind of swim away and it'll break on its own. And that's it. Now, this picture was taken in the Bahamas, uh, the place where I did my, um, my field work. And uh, it was very fortunate that these guys were there with cameras and they saw this baby little lemon shark um, being born out there. Now, finally, the third and last type is sort of a cross of the previous two. So there's no egg, there's no capsule, as you can see. There's also no umbilical cord. So what we have here is called a placental, so without placental, a placental viviparity, which means that the embryos develop inside the mother. Um, they will absorb the the yolk sac, the yolk sac here, and they'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as as they get uh, big enough, they will just exit the the mother's uh, womb when they're they're born. Now. One interesting aspect about this type of breeding is that in some species, you will have what's called uh, intrauterine cannibalism. Now, I know it's a big word, but let's think about it. Intrauterine, so something is happening inside the uterus, inside the womb, cannibalism. And you probably guessed what this means already. It means that those big baby sharks inside the mother will actually eat each other, and only one will be born. Uh, the bigger one. So next time, uh, one species that shows this is, for example, our friend here, the sand tiger shark. Very common uh, along, uh, well, all temperate waters. You'll find them in the Indian Ocean, off Africa, off, off um, America, off Europe, uh, Australia. They're known as sand tigers in America, as raggies, ragged tooth sharks in South Africa, as gray nurse sharks in Australia. But these sharks, very, very uh, popular in public aquariums as well. Uh, they do have this intrauterine uh, cannibalism, which means that next time you see one of these fish, one of these animals in the ocean, whether or whether you see one in an aquarium, just think for a second when you look at it, that that animal you're looking at, at some point ate all its brothers when it was inside the mother's womb. It's the only reason why it's there, which I think is very, very cool. Now let's move on to a, um, a more unpleasant part of this talk, which is of course the, um, the tremendous uh, beating that sharks have been taking over the years. Um, sharks have been harvested for many, many reasons, for their fins, uh, for their cartilage, for their livers, for their skin. Uh, and they've been harvested for many, many years in the last, especially after World War II, it's been, uh, uh, an insane decline. And uh, a lot of times, thanks to, to these silly publications, like this uh, book that came out, Sharks Don't Get Cancer, and then another one, Sharks Still Don't Get Cancer. This is, um, I'm afraid, a complete and total fraud. Sharks do get cancer. Uh, it's true that they have a very, very strong immune uh, system. Uh, so they do get less cancer than other vertebrates. That is true. But it's not true that they don't get cancer. Now, let me explain a little better what happened here. Uh, because sharks do have less cancer, uh, the, the author of these books basically uh, wrote these books saying that because sharks don't get cancer, if people eat these pills made from shark cartilage, then of course they, that heals cancer, which is total rubbish, I'm afraid to say. 
uh, it would be nice if it was so, but you know, it, it's, it's just not so. Uh, but I, I will explain what happens. So the physiological process, the, the, the way a cancer grows, it's basically by, well, like any organism, it, it needs to feed on something. So there's blood vessels that will there basically feed the cancer, which is basically a, a batch of cells that starts growing in a more uncontrolled way. Now, if you somehow are able to cut the food of those cells, if you can drain those blood vessels that are feeding those, those uncontrolled cells, out of control cells, uh, then you will basically dry that cancer. You, you will, um, you will, you know, it will force it to die because it, it gets no nourishment. And that is exactly the ability that sharks have. They can actually, um, isolate these blood vessels and they can make their growth stop. They can, uh, they can dry the cancer by not allowing it to feed. Now, of course, the big question is how do we humans replicate that process uh, to us? You know, how do we make a pill or some serum or something that we put in us humans and we're able to do that as well? Now, I can absolutely guarantee you that a lot of researchers are working on that around the world. I'm actually good friends with a few of them from the Moat Marine Lab in Sarasota in Florida, but not, that's not the only place in the world that's doing this. But the, the one thing that's absolutely for sure is that grinding shark cartilage and putting it into pills and taking those pills is not the way to get this, uh, you know, this, this ability, this remarkable ability that sharks have transferred to us humans. That's just not going to work. But anyway, these books and this myth that sharks don't get cancer and people eating shark cartilage pills is one of the reasons why sharks got pounded so severely by, by fisheries. Another reason is this, is the fins. Of course, we all know how uh, uh, shark fin soup is a very expensive delicacy in Asian markets and sharks are being killed all over the world uh, a lot of times just for their fins. And a lot of times you, the fishermen will cut off their fins, throw away the carcass, which of course this, the, that poor shark is just going to bleed to death or maybe without the fins, it's just not able to swim properly. So of course it'll just asphyxiate. It, it won't be able to drive oxygen from the, the, the ocean, from the water to its gills. So the very, very sad happening. This is actually a sad piece of news. It's in Portuguese, but for a long time, we thought that this was not occurring in European waters, that the sharks were being harvested in European waters, the fins were cut on shore and then sold to the Asian market. And it turns out that the, the police actually found out last year some fins in a Portuguese fishing vessel, so just the fins, which means that the carcasses were thrown overboard, which was very, very sad news. Made us all think, oh man, we thought this was a you know, more, distant, more distant phenomenon. Turns out it's actually happening here as well. Now, the good news is that some organizations like Wild Day are working with, uh, with movie stars and with the uh, sports stars, like this young man, Yao Ming. He's a um, very famous basketball player who, who plays in, uh, in America. And, uh, but Yao says no to shark fin soup. You can see he's you know, pushing away a shark fin soup bowl. And, uh, and this campaign has been extremely successful, for example, uh, our friend Jackie Chan um, is the, the, the friend of the rhinoceros. So by uh, having these famous Asian movie sports stars, uh, TV stars, you know, each of them pleading for help, you know, let's save the tigers, let's save the panda bears, let's save sharks. This campaign has actually been working very well. Now, we've had some campaigns in Europe as well. This is one I've been very much involved with a few years ago. Uh, there was going to be this vote to, in Europe, in uh, the European Commission in Brussels to stop feeding. And this, uh, this lady, a politician, a Portuguese politician, was in fact in favor of stopping feeding, of course. I mean, I think everybody who is lucid uh, wants to stop feeding. But she was proposing slightly different legislation. So she was not in favor of, let's say, the main anti-finning legislation because she was proposing something else. Anyway, people didn't understand this. So they went on Facebook, on her social media, 
with horrible images like you see here um, on the screen, you know, just bloody images of bloody sharks saying, ah, this politician wants to kill sharks, when in fact, uh, she wanted to save sharks as well, but just going through a different legal um, way of doing it. We, with the, you know, with the, um, the Portuguese uh, Elasmobreak Association, we actually came to her defense on social media saying, oh, wait a minute, uh, this lady is not trying to kill sharks. She's actually trying to save them, but she's going for a different type of legislation. The point here is that sharks are in desperate need of conservation. And it's, it's very easy for these little nuances on legislation to fall through the cracks and people just want blood and they sometimes don't really know what they're supporting. So it's important to read the fine print and it's important to understand the measures that you're uh, supporting. Now we're firm believers of um, email terrorism. Well, I shouldn't word, use the word terrorism. It's, it's a negative word, but you, you understand what I mean. What I mean is that it's good to sign petitions. Um, of course, you know, I'll tell you, in fact, I'll tell you right now that um, we've been very, very active with this petition, the stop feeding petition that wanted to, to uh, get 1 million signatures and show the European Commission that, uh, that European citizens want to protect sharks in European waters. And uh, we did this through our website, you know, um, and we were very, very diligent about it. But imagine this, we did get 1 million signatures. Portugal and France were amongst the first countries that reached their quota. Each country had to reach a quota. For example, our German friends here had almost half a million signatures on their own, which is absolutely insane. Look at this, almost uh, 500,000 signatures. But imagine if instead of 1 million 200 signatures on this petition, we actually had sent 1.2 million emails to politicians. I mean, that's very different. One thing is you get a petition of 15,000 signatures, which is like one email saying, well, 15,000 people signed this thing. Another thing is when you get 15,000 emails. So we've been very, very fervorous defenders of this sort of email policy. For example, uh, very recently, I've been asking people to send emails to the Minister of the Sea, Ministro do Mar in Portugal, asking for Mako shark protection. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but Mako sharks are basically, they breed at around 150 kilos and see they're being caught at 80, 60, 50 kilos. So they're being caught under age before they have a chance to breed, which is, uh, you know, which is not, not good at all. So I was asking people in Portugal to send emails to the minister so that we could finally have some Mako shark protection. And the good news is that it worked. We did this so diligent, diligently. We went on social media, we begged everybody, please send emails to politicians and ask them to, uh, to save Mako sharks. That in fact, last year in November, we managed to get Mako sharks protected for two years until the end of 2023, they're not allowed to be fished. So of course the next objective, the next objective is we got to get this, this, um, um, this, uh, this protection extended throughout you know, more years. Now, let's move on, and I'm nearly finished with the other ways that we can do, other things we can do to save sharks. For example, we can swim with sharks, take pictures, take video. Uh, many, many islands around the world have understood, you know, the Maldives, the Bahamas, they've understood that sharks are worth way more if they're alive, because tourists will pay $100, $150, dollars to be in the water with sharks just to, to film them, to take pictures of them, than if you sell their meat or even their fins. Uh, so sharks are way more valuable when they're alive. Needless to say that sharks in aquariums also have tremendous uh, conservation value. They help people understand about the problems they are facing. They help people understand about the, the extremely important role that they have in the oceans, keeping all the food chains in check. So I've had the, the privilege of working with aquariums for many years. And this is just one of many, many presentations we've done on how to transport and, uh, and handle sharks in a better way with aquariums. Uh, speaking of which, if you go to flyingsharks.eu, uh, the website of my consulting company, under literature, um, you will find a lot of papers we do. We write a lot of papers all the time. And you'll find one that's on the role of aquariums 
in ocean conservation. I actually wrote that myself. Uh, it's a chapter for the UN Encyclopedia on Sustainable Development. And uh, you're welcome to go there and just download it. Um, just click and download it for free and, uh, and you know, see the, the cool work we've been doing over the years and, and how aquariums have been playing a very important role in that work as well. Now, uh, other things we do with sharks is we tag them. I go out with my friends and um, we put these little tags uh, on this uh, blue shark, for example. And then after a few days, weeks, months, this shark is collected. So this, this is us uh, applying the tag to a small blue shark. This is my left finger, my left uh, index finger. A uh, little problem when you're doing this, just make sure you're actually uh, looking at the shark and you're not you know, talking to people and not paying attention to what you're doing because a blue shark will just snap its head and, and then you get nine stitches on your finger. Some people say, oh my God, this was a shark attack. No, 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 no. This was a stupidity attack. My stupidity because, you know, I should have been wearing gloves and I should have been paying attention to what I was doing. But in the process of removing the hook from a big shark, uh, this is what happened. So my fault, not the shark's fault, of course. So then we fill out this uh, card, you know, blue shark and, uh, and um, this is the species and the uh, geographic coordinates of where this shark was caught. And, uh, and the date, and this, this is what happened. See that number 311714, sometime after, we got this uh, report back from our friends in the National Marine Fishery Service in America, who provide the tags for free. They'll send these tags for free all over the world. And we know that the shark that we tagged in 2007 was collected off um, Morocco, in 2009. Now, obviously, this shark did not swim in a straight line all those years. This is just the beginning, you know, the origin and destination. But with, with the difference in length of the shark, that allows us to study its, its length. This is actually a, a length curve for some shrimp, but using the similar method that we use, uh, that I use with my students, my marine biology students, we estimate the length of marine animals just by uh, by using the, this method of looking at different lengths throughout time. Now, I'll just finish off by mentioning a few um, initiatives that we've had in Portugal. Uh, this is the week of shark protection. If you guys have the opportunity to do something like this in your countries, uh, by all means, and you feel free to contact me and I'll help you in any way I can. You know, basically go around and do lectures about sharks. Uh, feel free to, to use this lecture as well and to tell people about the perils that sharks are facing. This is some more posters. Uh, something for the young folks over there. If you want to study uh, sharks or even other species, feel free to send us an email to Flying Sharks. It's very easy, info at flyingsharks.eu. We've been handing out these scholarships to students for many, many years. Uh, we're up to very close to 100,000 years of small scholarships, you know, 500 euros here, 1,000 euros there. So feel free to drop us a line if you guys need some money to go to a conference, to go to an internship, and, uh, and we will gladly help you if we can. And I will just finish off with all the logos and all our websites. Uh, it's very easy to reach us. Uh, you know, we're very active on social media. Um, feel free to reach me through any of these websites. Uh, and uh, let me just thank you again for the time you you guys have uh, given me. And let me thank George again for the kind invitation to be with you all today. Thanks so much, guys.